Hello, hola, hola a todos, amigos, amigas. Welcome to Lima, Perú. Once again, welcome to your home here in the city of Lima, where we discuss about history, culture, tradition of this beautiful country, and in particular of, well, my city, Lima City. So today we're going to talk about great and famous explorers of Peru. Of course, all of the names I will be presenting to you are not of Peruvians, are of travelers, of wise men, of scientists from the uh, 19th century and the early 20th century who, um, well, got put their eyes on, on Peru, set their eyes in Peru, got interested uh, in, in Peru for different reasons, uh, and they helped Peru become this wonderful, popular, famous place connected with, you know, like um, diversity uh, of flowers, plants, also uh, uh, this very well internationally recognized site connected with ancient cultures. So um, it is important to say that uh, most of the people, most of the scientists who help us become uh, this famous uh, destination uh, nowadays as a tourist destination were people who were not Peruvians, no? who were uh, interested in, in discovering new things, who were having this, you know, back inside of the adventure. Uh, and well, uh, for one reason or other, they ended up coming to this country. So uh, this is also a little tribute to all of these fabulous men in this occasion, we're just going to talk about men, but I will be preparing soon an event related with women and science in Peru, which is going to be, you know, I hope coming soon. Uh, not unfortunately on Hago, but it will be on YouTube because I am transitioning to YouTube as most of our guides, uh, the community of guides is trying to find different alternatives for streaming. Um, well, every everybody feels that we are a little bit against the clock because we want you to continue experiencing the world virtually as you have done since 2020. So um, thanks a lot for the people who are here today joining. And let me say first hi to uh, the well the, the group that is here today. So and also let me know if you are coming for the first time to my channel. If it's the case, well, Warm welcome to you all, amigos. Hola, Nicolas. It's been long since last time I see you in my events. Hola, Maggie. Hola, Charity. Marilyn. Hola, hola, Cari, Cari. Hola, hola. Hola, Terry. Terry, ¿cómo estás? Hans, hello, Helen. Hola, Maggie. Oh, thanks for coming. Thanks for visiting from California, San Francisco. Oh, I, I, I assume it's also sunny there in San Francisco. It is also very hot here in Lima, by the way. I know that you are in the opposite, you know, like a hemisphere and it might be a little bit, you know, much colder probably. Um, but I hope it's, it's sunny where you are. Sunny and windy, Maggie. Oh, that's a lovely combination. I love that. I love that. Um, Lima is now like we continue in the sensation of summer. And that is because the temperature of the ocean of the um, Actually, the, the current that we're going to talk about today is related with one of our explorers, <laughs> the humble current. Um, it's, it's now sort of like a being moved, uh, uh, like pushed south. And we are having the influence of a different current coming here, which is uh, the El Nino current. It is a warm current that changes a lot the climate in the coast of Peru. And all of this you know, like uh, things now we know about the nature of my country, about why Peru and the coast of Peru in, in particular is such desertic. We have a, a desert coast. It rains nothing almost in the coast of Peru. We know thanks to one of these famous explorers, you know, why. So um, in a moment, we're going to begin. And uh, so once again, please let me say hi to the people who are joining. Hola, Sue. Um, also, earlier today, I did a, a little demo uh, tour on YouTube. So please make sure of following uh, me if you would like to continue. Uh, oh, gracias, Cari. <laughs> gracias, gracias. Um, thank you so much. If you would like to continue follow, following my events and, and learning more about Peru's history, uh, I do events from home and I do 
I do events also outside in the city, uh, city tours like most of our colleagues. I am a licensed tour guide, so um, I am used to talk about history and also take you to places related with history. So please follow my YouTube channel. Um, you can also find access to my YouTube channel on my Hago description. Uh, you can give me a follow if you haven't done it yet. Somewhere here in the upper part, there is a button for uh, following if you haven't yet. And there in the um, description, you're going to find my YouTube channel and my Instagram. At the end also, I will let you know about my other social medias. So are you ready to begin? Oh, and thanks a lot for staying there still. Uh, these days are, you know, busy in Hegel. So your time, uh, sharing your time with me means a lot. So vamos, let's go, vamos. Okay, amigos, amigas, I'm so happy that you are interested in, in this theme and my well, my wish is with all of these events I've been doing for you in this more or less, you know, over two years in, in Hago, um, since even it was virtual trips, uh, it, it was just to, to share the, the true side of Peru, the true history of Peru. You can find in many, even YouTube channels, you know, and, and, and sites uh, around the world, like all kinds of different information about Peru and well, most of the times it's not information that um, can be corroborated, right? Um, so my events are all connected with uh, sort of like scientific and investigations or uh, investigations um, made by archaeologists and anthropologists. So I think this could be a good source of information for you all to really get the, the truth uh, about uh, the history of this part of the world. So... Talking about famous explorers of Peru is talking about also an era of big changes in, in my country, in my territory, which is in particular uh, the beginnings of the 19th century, uh, the 1800s, in which Peru was little by little, oh, gracias, Charity, uh, my, my YouTube channel is here, Charity, our friend is sharing it, so you can uh, use it uh, at the end of this tour for also seeing my other events, my pre-recorded events. Gracias, Charity. Um, so it was a time of changes. As, as you know, 19th century, the beginning of 19th century, most of the countries of South America uh, and the Hispanic Americas were still under, under the uh, uh, control or dominion of Spain. No? Um, of the uh, Back then, it was the empire no? of, of Spain. No? Spain was you know, all over the globe, uh, from the Philippines, you know, big part of the Americas, you know, Europe, Africa also had territories that were controlled by Spain. So, uh, but it was a, a time also of decadence for Spain, right? So here we have uh, the first person uh, who um, was a, a formal scientific, like uh, he came to study Peru uh, as a scientific or uh, as an investigator, also with the highest and most elevated um, culture and education uh, that corresponded back then in that time to the best scientists and explorers of the world. Um, his name is indeed familiar to many people uh, in Peru. His last name in particular is very famous. We all talk about this man without really knowing this man uh, all the time, right? Because when we think in Peru, uh, we think, for example, in the current, the cold current of water that we have in front of the coast of Peru that goes from south to north uh, along the coast of Peru, and that is uh, responsible for the, uh, the low temperatures in the coast of Peru because of the cold water we have, and the creation of the desert that we living in the coast of Peru. So we're talking about Alexander von Humboldt, but the current is called Humboldt Current. So everybody knows about uh, the Humboldt Current in Peru. And also it is called Peruvian Current uh, as well, this current. But most of the times we talk about the Humboldt Current. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gracias, Garity. So, um, well, here you can see a little description from Wikipedia I was able to take uh, uh, for you all. Uh, and 
let's talk about the this this character, no, the, this person who uh, also was born far, far, far away from from Peru. No, he was born in Berlin, and his full name was Frederick Wilhelm Heinrich. Uh, Alexander von Humboldt. No? So uh, this man came from a very, very wealthy family, mm? born in the year 1769, uh, to a, you know, a family uh, that gave him the most uh, dedicated education. Uh? He was destined, of course, to, to be pretty much like a, a novel man, no? He, he actually had novel titles, you know? Um, but he he was, since very young, interested in the botanics. He was interested in insects. He was in his garden. So I can imagine, you know, his, his mother being very worried about him, you know, getting dirty in the garden, you know, like... A, and, and also we know from some accounts related with this, Uh, this man and his family, that his mother was very distant, very cold. Uh, I assume it's, it's something, you know, of that time and the temperament of, of people, uh, the noble women in particular of that time. So her mom was very, very cold and very distant to him. Uh, so probably he found the comfort, you know, um, of his, in his heart from, you know, getting into this natural world, into, into this world of plants, herbs, insects, right? Uh, so he was born um, in the decade of the, the 60s of the 18th century. And in the time in question, when he came to Peru, he, um, he was still very young. He came to Peru in the year 1802, right? So before coming to Peru, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> before coming to Peru, He um, got a, a, the best education in two universities in Germany. Uh, his family was German and French also. Um, he even was able to meet a geologist and naturalist that belonged to the uh, expedition of Cook, right? Uh, this expedition around the world. You know? And that person, uh, George Foster, was a person who impulsed him to travel. Uh, he uh, motivated him uh, to continue with his mineralogy studies because he has, was interested in, in, you know, like learn about uh, also uh, stones, you know, and, and geography. You know? And he was motivated by this person. I assume that his family was not so happy with this, probably because uh, he was destined to be You know, the, the gentlemen, you know, that uh, of the house that will continue with the businesses. And traveling also was very, very dangerous back in those times. Uh, traveling, uh, you had to do your wheel before taking a ship. <laughs> uh, that, that was the way. Uh, people uh, had a, a quite high percentage of dying uh, on board of, of a ship uh, um, until not so long ago. And also because of the diseases that people, everybody was afraid uh, to get in distant locations. Uh, we are not yet talking about, for example, the time of the immunizations and the vaccines, which happened a little bit later after. Um, but, well, he was a person of very strong spirit. So here you can see the voyage of Humboldt. Uh, the trip of Humboldt, a grand trip uh, that began uh, in the year 1799 and ended on 1804. Uh, let's say five years more or less of, of travel uh, in, in which he uh, got into, you know, at Spain first. And from there, he traveled to, to the Hispanic Americas uh, and also part of, you know, the, the territories uh, in, of, of North America, which in that time also, you know, where most of them not yet in explored, not yet investigated. So these were territories that were, you know, completely unknown. Oh, to my amigos that are joining, thank you so much for, for being here. We are talking about great explorers of Peru. Hola, Marilu. Hola, hola. Uh, so uh, one of these great explorers is Alexander von Humboldt. That's why we are seeing the name Humboldt in the upper part, right? So, well, uh, he traveled to the Hispanic Americas, of course, with the permission of the crown of Spain, because uh, he was not Spanish. 
And therefore, there were lots of limitations for people who were not Spanish to get into territories that were Spanish. Spain was very jealous with their uh, colonies, with its colonies, right? Uh, so, but he had a special permission because of his wealth, his status, and his intentions. Actually, he invested a lot of his own money in this trip. So it was really a, a, a win, not, not really win-win <laughs> in, in, in the sense of, you know, Spain allowed him to investigate his lands and he will get the benefits, you know, like information, but also, you know, he, they were not really investing that in, in money in, in this trip. But um, Alexander Humboldt had the money. So that was really not a problem. That was not a problem for him. Um, and, and it was a time when people started to, you know, discover new things, like lots of new discoveries. Uh, so he wanted to take part of this. So the trip was very big, as you can see. And he traveled to Venezuela, Colombia, eh, Ecuador, and also Peru here in South America. And he continued his trip to Mexico and to the United States. Well, nowadays, the United States, right? Um, so what about his trip to Peru? Oh, he's coming to Peru. So remember that first he came in, in this direction. He was in, in territories that were very warm, uh, very tropical, right? So he came to Peru um, much later in the year 1802, right? So he spent some time uh, exploring uh, warm territories. And he was able, when he came to Peru and to Lima in particular, to, to have quite an impression of the jungle tropical zones, right? Um, for example, this image you see here uh, is El, El Chimborazo. Chimborazo is a, is a mountain located in Ecuador. And back in those days, Chimborazo was believed to be the highest mountain in the Americas, right? So in this moment, uh, we know there's a, that's another one. Uh, there's another mountain that is the highest. Uh, is the Aconcagua in Argentina. But back in that time, everybody believed, because, of course, many places were not yet studied and, and investigated, that this Chimborazo, which has 6,300 meters above sea level approximately, you know, was the highest. And he traveled to this place and he explored it. Uh, and you can see von Humboldt here. Uh, and you can see also his comrade, uh, his companion, uh, Aime Bonplant. They traveled together in all this journey, in all this adventure uh, from beginning to end. So they were together going to different places. Um, also, well, uh, Bonplant, he was a scientist. He was a French scientist. So they, they well, took this long trip both together to learn and also in their own fields to investigate this territory. So, um, well, he went to the uh, Chimborazo mountain, you know, how, how brave this man is. I wonder if he tried coca leaf. I'm not very sure, but, uh, well, I think so, no? The, uh, the coca leaf is such important uh, plant for the people of the Andes. Uh, but back then, uh, many, many... Uh, Europeans that traveled to, to Peru um, and to Bolivia and to Ecuador when it was very common to for in, in all of our countries to chew coca leaf, you know, they that they consider that, you know, like disgusting, like putting a leaf in the in the mouth. But it is so effective. It is so so effective still nowadays we use it a lot. Anyways, um so Humboldt arrived to Lima, you can see here, you know, Lima, and well he came really through the port of Callao first, no? in August 1802. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, he began this, this trip uh, sort of like uh, northwards the coast of Peru. No? Um, but it was really, like, fantastic for him seeing this place. I mean, uh, he didn't love Peru. <laughs> like, let me just... You know, disclaimer, <laughs> he was not a fan of Peru um, and particular, I mean, not exactly like old Peru because he didn't see it all. He loved the Andes. He loved the mountains. He loved Ecuador, you know, and the and the, as, and the section of Peru was, you know, like very alike in many ways. But Lima was not his cup of tea. And how we know this? Well, he brought 
uh, different documents, books about his experience in this territory. And Lima and Callao, the port of Callao, were not really his favorite. Oh, for example, first of all, from the coast of Peru, Lima's coast and, and the coast uh, that he was able to see, um, he had such a impression uh, of the aridity of the coast that was really like very, very shocking for him because he was able to travel all the coastal territories, uh, more, more like north or wise, where there is a different current of water. This is the Panama current or El Nino current. It's a warm current of water, which we don't have much influence of it here because we have the Humble current, right? So in here, because the temperatures are higher, we have in the coasts of these territories, more rain. Also, the coasts are green, right? But in this territory, we have, well, no rain because the temperature of the Humble current or the Peruvian current is so low, approximately 14 degrees Celsius. It's very, very cold water. Also, it decreases the temperature in the atmosphere, and that's the reason why we don't have uh, precipitations of rain in this zone, right? But nobody really knew about the current. Like, nobody had any, any understanding of what this was, this was happening, what was happening here. So these observations were done by uh, Humboldt. He got fascinated like to see that difference. No? Uh, he said, how different this coast of Peru without any green, without any trees, without rain, you know, from Ica to Piura. Uh, Ica is in this location and Piura is over here. Yeah? Is from Guayaquil, for example. He said, no? where nature, hot and humid climate produce vegetation and the most luxuriant and majestic uh, uh, nature, right? So, well, his, his words were not really so, you know, <laughs> um, very, you know, like a, eh, sort of like a, describe, you know, that much affection for the coast of Peru, but he found it fascinating and this is the person that does the scientific investigations for a finally, you know, us understanding that our current of water, you know, it's not really coming from this, this location. It's coming from the Antarctica. You know, it's cold water. It, he was the person who proposed this idea because he said this is not, you know, like a current that is local because it's way too cold, he said. You know, it's not... Even the temperature of the ocean is lower than the temperature of the atmosphere. So that means that this water is coming from somewhere else. It's coming probably from the south, he said, oh, from the Antarctica. And now we know this current under this name, right? Well, um, we have here also a, a, a bird uh, that is another reminder of the importance of Humboldt because, uh, by the way, how many of you know the name of this penguin? Do you know the name of this penguin? Anyone in the group? Please let me know. Huh? You would surprise me a lot if you know the name of this penguin. <laughs> well, I think you can deduce it too. But anyways, anyone? No? Three, two, one, no? <laughs> Ah, uh, it's on the TV. <laughs> yes, Carrie, I know, I know. It's just there. Like, you know, like pull, pull your tongue out and you'll see the name. <laughs> it is the humble penguin. <laughs> it's not really that difficult. <laughs> well, because of course it receives the name of our uh, character, right? Um, so, well, we have also another important thing that we, uh, uh, you know, like owe to him, which is the fact that he took samples of a element uh, that in a period of our history made us a very, very rich. Uh, is the time of the ephemeris or volatile bonance uh, of Peru. Uh, guano. Guano is the poop of the seabirds. And guano was used in the pre-Hispanic times as a fertilizer. Then during the conquest period and the viceroyalty, it was not anymore used until finally 
uh, von Humboldt, uh, probably able to hear commentaries from uh, indigenous people he met on his trip. Oh, thank you, Hans. Muchas gracias, amigo. Thank you. <clears throat> commentaries of, of indigenous he met here in Peru uh, because he was always in contact with indigenous people, asking things to them, asking the local knowledge. And probably they mentioned about the use of, of this product of this excrement, this poop of seabirds. So he took elements, like um, some things from his trip. Gracias, John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to his laboratory in Europe. Like he was not able, of course, to investigate, uh, for example, the guano here in Peru. But years after, he published uh, his investigations. And he was the person who helped uh, the world know about the properties of guano, in particular, how rich in nitrogen guano is, right? So we know it thanks to Humboldt. Oh, gracias, Helen. Thank you, amiga. Um, and, and to be honest, Humboldt was a very, very angry with Peru, you know, when he was, you know, more older and mature and when Peru was living out of guano because initially we didn't give him any credits of his investigations. Well, uh, of course, his investigations were done to, for the, to the crown of Spain, like Polish for the crown and thanks to the crown also. Uh, this happened before the independence. The independence happened a couple of decades after he traveled to Peru in the year 1821 until 1824. And then after... You know, the investigation of Humo was used to begin with the exploitation of guano. Okay. Finally, uh, Humo didn't like the port of Callao either. So it's not just Lima because of the desert. He didn't like the port of Callao because he was a little bit like, um, you know, uh, snobby. <laughs> Snob? <laughs> I th in my opinion, but it's understandable. He was like, you know, a man of very, very rich, you know, background. He was not used to, you know, like dirty places. In his commentaries, in in one of his um, documents, he 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 he, 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 he made. Uh, um, oh, let me just sorry, I touched this by mistake. Um, he says about Callao, the port of Callao, that. You know, it's a very dirty place. You know, it's a very, he didn't like at all oh, uh, the Port of Callao uh, because of, you know, like probably the lack of sewers. <laughs> so, well, but it's understandable indeed. You know, it's a different type of location and different part of the world. So, uh, anyways, we will continue now with Antonio Raimondi. He was Italian oh, and he is known as the most beloved Italian scientist in our country, uh, in the history of, of Peru. Antonio Raimondi is um, probably the, the most famous Italian in the country because we have lots of monuments dedicated to him. And his story in Peru is, is really fantastic because he came to Peru um, in a time in which we were already a republica. Oh, we were an independent country. We were a country, you know, with trying to find who we were, right? We came out from the Viceroyalty period and we are now in the search of our own identity. And we were making, and still we make, lots of mistakes. So we were in the, in the mistakes uh, period, but also a country that was not explored yet properly. Alexander Bohumbo came in uh, 1802 and then... You know, the explorations stopped because of the period of the independences of, of the Americas. Um, so it was not really a good time for scientific investigations here, right? And nobody promoted those. Mm -hmm. So uh, Antonio Raimondi was born in the year 1824. Oh, uh, and he uh, was, since very young, interested also in botanics, in nature. Um, he studied in Milano. No? Uh, Milan, we say here in, in Spanish, no? uh, courses of natural history. No? Uh, and the moment he gets to hear about Peru is very interesting. And he shared uh, this, this first encountering with Peru in Italy in his book, El Peru. Uh, it's a book uh, that is also one of the most important 
uh, scientific investigations of, of, of the country. It took him many, many decades to finish it. And it was published in the year 1874. Uh, so Helen says, so he never went home. Helen, uh, in the case of Raimondi, he stayed in Peru. In the case of Humboldt, the previous um, personality we talk about, he returned to, to Europe after the, he, he didn't stay in the country. But Raimondi stayed here. Uh, and he set his roots here. He got married here. He had children here. Right? Um, so he got to understand Peru more profoundly. No, he was not just coming a couple of months. No, uh, let me tell you how it was this this moment when he first uh, hear about Peru, right? And he brought this. Uh, it's a little extra expert. Uh, I will extra. I'm going to share with you from his book El Peru, the, the Peru, no Peru. One day, he said, while I was, as usual, in the botanical garden of Milan, I witnessed by a rare chance the cutting of a gigantic cactus, Cactus Peruvianus, which, having risen like a monstrous chandelier to the roof of the conservatory, covered a large part of it. The mutilation of this patriarch of the cacti which was one of my favorite plants, caused me a vague regret, as if it had been an animated and sensitive being. And this strange circumstance turned into my first sympathy for Peru, an omen, without a doubt, of my future trip to this country. Hmm? So he arrived to Peru no, with the well, cultivated indeed no, of, of a land that he didn't knew much about, uh, but with the intentions of investigated, uh, investigated this, this place. Mm -hmm. From the 40 years he lived in my country in Peru, 19 years he dedicated just to travel in my country. Uh, like imagine traveling in a time where there were no trains, no buses, because many of the places he visited were completely unknown places, even for the government of Peru. So uh, he traveled on foot, on on donkey, on on horse, you know, <laughs> um, and and he most of his these adventures created in him a very special connection. Uh, with not just the, you know, his field of investigation, but also with the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of these investigations he did uh, were paid by his own money. So initially his investigations were paid by him, but later as he was able to, to get more prestige, he was able also to become professor of the very important university, San Marcos Universidad de San Marcos, which was, by the way, the first university of the Americas established in 1551 in Lima, Peru, in the convent of the Dominican Order. So uh, that university was already, you know, very important when he came to Peru. He is, uh, taught, uh, he was teacher of um, natural science uh, with emphasis in botanics. Um, and later he became dean uh, of the faculty of natural science. Uh, so a very important person. Uh, and this is the cover of his book, El Peru. He was, uh, you know, this was the most important work of his life. You know? He published it in six volumes between the year 1875 until uh, 1913. You know? um, in, his, in his preface, uh, the preface of this book, he calls all Peruvians, as all Peruvians, to study the natural wells of Peru because he knew Peruvians didn't know anything about their own country. And also because we had our eyes set out. You know, Peruvians had always lived between these, these worlds of, you know, Europe, uh, and in particular Lima, you know, Lima, which is where most of the concentration of the capital 
uh, sorry, of the population of, of the country is. So um, is the largest territory in the country. Um, he uh, knew that, that people were sometimes feeling more identified with Europe, the, with Spain, you know, or later after the independence with, with, with France uh, than us here in Peru, right? So he impulsed people to study uh, their own country first because nobody loves what, you know, doesn't know. Right? You have to know your country to love it. Uh, what you are seeing here, by the way, is a, uh, a plant, uh, is, is a flower, actually, because it's a, like a plant with flowers, and it's called Puya de Raimondi. Puya de Raimondi. The Puya de Raimondi is a huge plant. It's huge. It reaches five meters more or less tall. So a person will be this high, this tall, right? And it actually flowers but it's not very usual. It flowers every decade. Also, oh? it is very rare to see a Puya de Raimondi flowering. Um, so it was given his name also, Raimondi, Puya de Raimondi. Mm? Um, so also I have another piece related with him. This is the Estela de Raimondi. Oh, gracias. Oh, gracias. See, you have to look for that. That flower is incredible. I've never seen one, you know, like in, in bloom in my life. I have traveled a lot and I haven't seen, seen any. Uh, and they take long to, to blossom. Uh, um, this piece of a stone you see here, this is a stone piece. I'm, I'm showing you the image of the stone. Uh, it is located in a museum, a national museum, the Museum of Archaeology, Anthropology and History of Peru. And that museum uh, has an amazing collection of pieces. Many of them were recollected by this gentleman, by Raimondi. And the piece, the stone piece, uh, was discovered by Raimondi by, by chance. It's, it's very big, the stone. The, uh, it's called Estela de Raimondi. Raimondi is Estela. And he discovered it uh, by accident. He was traveling in the central North Andes of Peru, you know, like in his regular trips. And he was invited to the house of a, of a group of, of peasants uh, from, from the Andes in a little, little house that, you know, like uh, of, of stone and, and, you know, such rooftop uh, to eat. No? So he accepted the invitation. Of course, he got in. He sat uh, to the table, right? And something called his attention, like powerfully, because he saw this table that was completely not matching with the, you know, like the like simplicity of the house, because everything was very, you know, simple. And the table was perfectly polished, perfectly square, like a rectangle. So he touched the, the surface and it was perfectly polished. And then his curiosity took him to touch below the table. And he felt lines, you know, like uh, curves. And they fe he felt uh, like shapes. And finally, he, he couldn't more. And he asked the, the owner of the house to please, like, move the table because he wanted to see what was below. So the family said, okay, yes, let's do it. So... He saw this <laughs> and he asked to the, to the people there like, how this thing ended up in your house. And, and they said, well, it has always been here. Uh, maybe my great grandfather brought it into the house because I know it has always been here. So it ended up being that this stone really was originally in an archaeological site not far away from there. And it was used as a table. So he married a Peruvian woman, and that could be, of course, the, the biggest example uh, of his love for Peru, uh, because setting, you know, like roots here in, in a land is fully embracing that land. So he married a Peruvian woman, Adela Loli Castañeda, and he had three children with her. Right? Uh, so this is the story of Mr. Raimondi. Who knows this man, the third person of our selected group of famous uh, explorers of Peru. Oh, muy bien, John. Glad to know you have here about 
Hyde and Bingham. Yes, Marilyn, especially everybody that has been to Machu Picchu owns being able to see Machu Picchu and to know about Machu Picchu in part due to his investigation. Well, but he is indeed a controversial character uh, for many Peruvians. I think not for the scientific world, uh, but for Peruvians, for some Peruvians, yes. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to go on top of that in a moment. Haram Bingham, you know, was a, you know, not really an archaeologist. Um, when he came to Peru, at least he was not an archaeologist, but he studied history. And he was a, a lecturer, a, a professor of history in Yale University, right? Uh, by the way, I always have troubles pronouncing the name of the university because it seems that we Latin Americans have big problems between the, the world of a prison and the world of the university, <laughs> jail and jail. <laughs> so sorry if I make a mistake when I'm pronouncing the name of the university. I hope you don't feel bad about it. I'll try uh, to improve it, but it's still there's something there uh, that I don't know why cannot pronounce it correctly. So the story of this university and, and Bingham is important uh, and, and it has created, you know, like uh, also has helped uh, to create this, this very important name uh, of Bingham as an adventurous, you know, a man as an explorer. Um, so, well, Bingham, although he's remembered more for his, you know, investigation of Machu Picchu and the scientific discovery of Machu Picchu to the world, because Haydn Bingham was not the first one in Machu Picchu, right? And that is a fact. Even Haydn Bingham uh, described this and, and, and wrote about this in his book, uh, uh, that is the, the most famous book uh, about his exploration of Machu Picchu, you know, the lost city of the Incas. So um, there were people before him uh, in, in, in Machu Picchu, but they didn't have the reach Haram Bingham have, had uh, um, later no, to, to make this place such such famous site. Ellen is commented he was 62 when he got married. Oh, really? Oh, my God, really? I think he was married two times, right? Like uh, in my investigation, I learned that he was married to a uh, Harris of Tiffany's, uh, Tiffany's, uh, jewelry, uh, store. Um, and also his first wife, uh, supported his travels, uh, and, and, he, and she also supported big part of the, of the expenses of his investigation, his trip and exploration to Machu Picchu, right? He was quite handsome indeed. Yes, Marilyn, very handsome gentleman and very young came to Peru. Uh, in his early 40s, he came to Peru. Uh, but he had a trip before Peru, like not the one, you know, of Machu Picchu. He visited Peru before, um, not with the intention of doing such uh, scientific researches. Um, he went to a Pan American uh, conference in Chile first. Uh, it was the year 1908. And, he, well, he was invited to go there. Uh, and then... When he was returning to North America, he stopped in Lima. He stopped in, in Callao. And he was convinced uh, to go to explore Choquequirao, no? an archaeological site that also he helped to, you know, to publicize uh, the, the place, the site. No? And that's the moment when he got interested in pre-Hispanic history because he was interested in the, the biography of Bolivar. So, so people from the uh, independence period of uh, South America, right? Bolivar uh, and his campaigns and all of that. So he was doing a biography of him. Um, but well, suddenly, you know, direction took, uh, life took a different direction. Like us here in Hegel, <laughs> we're, you know, suddenly we're going in different directions now. So um, later, well, after seeing the potential of Peru and the many sites that were not uh, yet investigated. So he decided to come back, but he needed money, right? He first published a book called Across South America. I think here is the book. Yes. Across South America, an account of a journey from Buenos Aires to Lima. Uh-huh. So, uh, and with notes about the trips he did to different parts of, of this region. 
Oh, and also he got support uh, of friends of him who said, you have to go back to that place. You have to go investigate. Um, that would be, you know, like a important thing for you. you know? So um, he got interested in something different now. Um, there was a friend of him, Mr. Edward S. Harkness, uh, who read this book here. And he got fascinated about the things being hand so, And he said, amigo, you have to go back because there are cities where the Incas had their last bastions that have not been yet, you know, like uh, found it. Like uh, we don't know exactly where they are. There are many cities, but we don't know which ones they are. So you have to go there. Now, that would be good for you. So he will came back. Right. And he studied his his experience, his exploration, and he found actually without him knowing it, the two last bastions of the Incas. Right. Um, but he didn't identify those as, you know, bastions uh, because um, he, these places were in such like terrible situation, like, uh, you know, they were very simple constructions. Um, they were like uh, not in good shape. They were in the jungle zone almost, right? Um, so he said, no, this couldn't be because, you know, the, the, the last cities should be like grandiose, you know? But no, he was, he was mistaken. Later, we know thanks to other investigations, like for example, uh, Mr. Vince uh, Lee, uh, who uh, later, I think it was the decade of the 70s, he finally like uh, realized that those cities being visited were in fact the last bastions. And why those places were not in that good shape? Well, because the last bastions of the Incas were built in a short period of time. They were new cities. The Incas didn't have much time to build a, gr a great city, a, a grandiose city like Cusco that took hundreds of years to be built. And also material in that zone was scarce because we're talking about the jungle. So there were no stones in that zone, uh, enough stones to build the Inca style architecture. Uh, but later... You know, this is, by the way, Lima. When he came to Lima first, before going to the Andes, he took some pictures. He, he was traveling with a camera Kodak. And he registered lots of the, the city uh, of, of Lima pictures. Well, this is, I think, the only one I will share with you. But, uh, you know, I am from Lima, so I had to share this with you. Look at the Cathedral of Lima. Yeah, we're talking about the year 1911. Uh, and look at the government palace if you've been with me on my city tours uh, in main square of lima we don't have any more this building this building is gone we have a complete different one now the, the nowadays house of the presidents of peru is from the year 1938 so a lot of things have changed in that picture nowadays and and yes i i i love to see like that lima that hide and bingham so no, so I, I wanted to share this with you. Sorry for taking you to a different direction. Gracias, Kari. Gracias. Um, so here we are in front of, of the site. Bingham believed was the, the lost city of the Incas. So the, he referred to the lost city of the Incas, basically to, the, to that last bastion in which the last Inca kings who separated from the Spanish and continue, because we continue having some level of, in some zones, independency from the Spanish, we continue having the Incan empire, uh, but they were trying to live in a bubble and that didn't work much. That didn't work, unfortunately, well. Uh, and, and finally, in the 1570s, uh, well, that intention of continuing, you know, like separated from the Spaniards um, was stopped. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, he saw this place and he, he thought, of course, this is the place. This is Machu Picchu nowadays. Nowadays. How beautiful, right? We're going to see the Machu Picchu that he saw. And you'll, you'll tell me, how do you think about it? Huh? This is an original picture, you know, uh, taken by uh, Bingham uh, of his trip, uh, 1911, mm, of the site. It's still majestic, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, 
you know, like uh, seeing this place with his eyes. Wow. No? And nobody there. Look at look at also all the vegetation you see here. Oh, Maggie, sorry, I saw I just saw that your um, comment. I have a colleague friend whose family is from Lima, Peru. Oh, really, Maggie? Oh, so they are from my city. Oh, oh, so you have to go to the to the house of your friend to eat because Limenians cook wonderfully. <laughs> so you have to go there. I promise. You know, you have to go often to, to see your friend's family <laughs> and find a way to be invited to eat there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, Mike. Oh, Mike. Yes. Do you talk about, are you talking about Mike? Mike in Cusco or your friend is Mike? Just let me know, please. Because we have a Mike from Hegel in Cusco. He's a wonderful tour guide. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Your friend, Mike. We have a guy called Mike also here. <laughs> Miguel. Um, so. Let's see, you know, other pictures. Oh, this is like some camp, some pictures I took from the uh, website of uh, the National Geographic. You know, this investigation also was sponsored by the National Geographic. And it's important to mention them, of course. Oh, the National Geographic Society supported also uh, Bingham in other trips he did later uh, in the year to, uh, 1912, 1914, 1915. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you know, Haram Bingham, look at the camera used back then, right? Such like incredible, you know, like carrying this camera and walking on the on the fences of Machu Picchu, you know, like uh, and and completely, you know, like uh, almost deserted. But there were people who knew of Machu Picchu. So let's just debunk that myth that nobody knew of Machu Picchu, just him. You know, uh, first of all, we know that a, a person guided him into Machu Picchu. Mr. Melchor Artiaga led Bingham to this site, right? Also, there are documents from before the trip of Hiram Bingham uh, that mention Huayna Picchu, uh, the, the hill in front. Uh, that this is the Huayna Picchu young mountain uh, uh, in, in translation from Quechua uh, in, in all the documents in maps. Mm -hmm. We have also in, in some sites of this, this place, you know, like uh, uh, names of other travelers. They are travelers who even were here as early as 1901. Uh, uh, explorers uh, um, and also indigenous we cannot forget the indigenous they were indigenous here who live very close to the site right so they were the ones who were with him in in some of the pictures uh, of that he took so if you can please go to to the site of the national uh, uh, geographic society uh, to see more of these images. John is commenting, who owned the site before being up? Ah, um, oh, let me remember the name. I have so many names in, in this moment. So the, the situation, John, is like this. There's a family, Lizarraga, who um, own like the biggest stand of territory in which Machu Picchu was inside, right? But, you know, back in those old days, uh, you could get land like just for, you know, like a marking like a, alongside the river, for example, Urubamba on the on the left bank for, I don't know, like 50 kilometers, something like that. So they were just in document, but nobody really in, knew what which things were inside. There are many people who in the colonial times, you know, like uh, make use of temples uh, and they put churches on top of them. Like ancient temples, you know, were used as, you know, like a base for churches. So I think it was the Lizarraga family. Uh, um, so, but well, thanks God, nobody really intended to destroy uh, Machu Picchu. Also, uh, very inaccessible. So uh, in the book, The Lost City of the Incas, a bestseller also, uh, in, in which Haram Bingham tales by his own words, you know, his exploration of this site. He believes that this was a religious shrine, uh, like a, 
probably because, well, first of all, that the type of architecture, the location, the ceremonial zones, and probably what he's heard from the indigenous people there. So he postulated that this was a religious site. But now archaeologists don't believe uh, that anymore. They don't support anymore that theory. They believe it was a place of, th there are some theories. One is that it was the, the sort of like a, um, like a resort for the Inca, uh, like a, during the summer period. Uh, also, that was a place of, of government. Also, there were ceremonies that happened uh, there, but it was like a secondary house for the Inca to rule from there. Uh, and there is another theory that I find it also very reasonable. Um, also, my husband, he's an archaeologist too. Um, well, not too, because Haida Minga was not an archaeologist, but <laughs> he is an archaeologist. Uh, he um, believes that that place was sort of like a university, a place of education, a place of training, a place where people could also do measurements of the stars, for example, uh, like a solstices, they could observe solstices, they could, they could be trained and also exchange information one another uh, related with, you know, like... Um, so something quite close to, to what we'll say scientific investigations, but everything was related with religion there. So, you know, it was not, you know, like a, it couldn't be separated. Okay. So um, there are controversies about Haida Bingham, and we have to talk about those controversies. Uh, for example, Bingham is considered responsible for illegally extracting 46,332 Inca archaeological pieces you know, property of Peru, you know, okay. And taking them to Yale University in the United States, of course. Oh, um, so, well, this this is, of course, not easy to be solved because, uh, I mean, back then there were no proper museums or places uh, or even, you know, like uh, intentions for uh, protecting archaeological pieces like, like those. But now we do have those or proper proper places and you know professionals and all of that but you know things were not so easy well when uh, peru started to claim back because they were given like sort of like landed but then they didn't return so it uh, peru fought for a long time to get back pieces uh, and finally Yale university returned in the year 2011 pieces how many pieces do you think a university, Yale University returned? Remember, they were taken, of course, some, some of these 46,332 pieces were fragments, were not like big pieces. And some of them were, of course, intact pieces. Uh, while this happens, I will also check. Please comment, eh? right, please. While I, I check on the question of John, what is the source of the name of Machu Picchu? It's an indigenous name in Quechua. It is the name given by the people of the community uh, of that zone, John. Machu Picchu refers to old mountain. And Huayna Picchu, young mountain. Oh, so Pichu means mountain. Uh, also, John is coming there. Has Jail given them back? Oh yes, yes. Of course, I will be. I will be telling you exactly that, amigos. So John says a hundred pieces. Well, um, a little bit more. A little, well, that's good, but not really. You know, super good because they should be more. I think um, the pieces are in exhibit in Casa Concha, which is this museum. You can also give a look to the website over here. Right, of this side later. And in total, the Casa Concha Museum says that 366 pieces were returned, right, to Peru. Oh, so not much, <laughs> not much, unfortunately. Oh, but uh, maybe at some point, more will come, okay? So uh, these are my three explorers of Peru who uh, have changed uh, the history, you know, of, of this nation. I really hope you enjoy this event. Let me turn on the light so you can see me a little bit better. And also, I would like to share with you my social medias, if it's okay. I hope you, you don't mind if I do that. Just give me a second. Uh, the best way to do it now, let me turn the, the camera on the other side. 
So is over here on um, Linktree. Well, I found, oh, gracias, Cari. Gracias, gracias. I hope this, this is my very last historic event here on Hegel because, you know, like um, Hegel is closing on April 11. And I know many of my colleagues are putting lots of events and I, I know it's not, there's not time enough for all of us to put, to post events. And I want not to take as much of, you know, the space of the platform for, I would like to do more events, but I prefer, you know, like uh, to, to make room for all of the guys uh, to also say properly goodbye, you know, to you all. Um, if you can come to my events on YouTube, I promise I will, make them you know as you know as good or even better i'm learning every time something new with your recommendations your suggestions uh, if you want to know how to you know like access to all my social medias link three and also you can copy this link over here Mm -hmm. and and you can see also my website you can see also my youtube you know like i have everything here let me just help you with this so you click here you have my tiktok yes i do tiktoks <laughs> instagram facebook uh so anything uh all the information is here right so um one second i put here if you want to make a picture of this you can also support um on a okay can you see this do, do, do. Yeah. so Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, you can support also the, your, your guide in Lima, if you wish, on PayPal. I have founded PayPal as a way that most people accept or, or trust in. I know, unfortunately, not everybody likes PayPal. I'm, I'm so, so, so sad for that because many of the uh, other options like buy me a coffee or some other are not uh, like a, are very hard for me to connect with Peru. So uh, PayPal is a little bit more direct. So if you can, please subscribe. If you can support and please join to all my events, you are Welcome to come. Welcome. Let me turn the camera to see you again, to, to read your comments. Uh, gracias. Thanks for the kind words. Every time I, I, I learn so, so much every time I do my events for you because um, I, I love to learn. I love to read. And there are different ways to, to learn. Uh, one of the most effective ways I have found it to learn about to learn things, especially as a tour guide, is first of all, you learn when you read or hear about something the first time. Then you learn where you take notes about that, and then you learn even more when you teach what what you share. You know what you are learning with others. So, uh, and and this is something we all tour guys are doing here in the platform we are learning because we are teaching uh so thank you john muchas gracias please come to my youtube uh events um they they probably will not be super super great in the beginning because i am starting to get used to <laughs> that system but well thanks a lot for for your interest oh scary no i'm going to miss you a lot Cari, i'm going to be doing a, a last event for you know like singing and you know on um friday so if you can please join Cari amigos gracias maja marilu gracias gracias amigos su gracias 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 i'm reading you all very fast like really helen if you subscribe to you uh-huh Sí, yes, yes, of course, Helen, gracias, thanks for that. Also, I lost a lot of followers in YouTube. We, we are trying to, all the guys, reach 1,000 people for subscribing. Initially, I believe that it was necessary for streaming 1,000 people, but no, you can stream from 50 person, but uh, you can unlock lots of elements that are going to improve the experience, especially something called super chat which seems that is going to be really helpful for us um so yes gracias caitlin gracias marilu gracias see you soon amigos thanks for your support and until the next time
Uh, hasta pronto. This is not an adios. This is hasta pronto. Uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.